This video is brought to you by Squarespace. From websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. Welcome back, everybody. In this video, we are going to talk about the video capabilities of the new Fujifilm X-T4. This is a pre-production model that Fuji were kind enough to send me for about a week. I did a video already, and in that video, I talked about mostly the stills capabilities, the new image stabilization. There is a lot going on with this camera in terms of improvements, and so I I wanted to break this out and do a completely separate video, which is this one, where we're just going to talk about video capabilities. So when the previous model, the X-T3, was released, I think that was one of those groundbreaking cameras in terms of the feature set that Fujifilm included, giving us these tools to do all these incredible things with video. So we now had 4K recording, everything from 24p up to 60p. We had 10-bit output. Your chroma subsampling was 420 internal. You could use an external recorder and go out to 422. That was a really incredible camera, I think, especially for the price that it came at. So the X-T4 has taken a lot of that group of feature sets and it's improved on them. And I want to clear this up because there's two comments I've been seeing. First of all, people think that this is just kind of an update to the X-T3. I wouldn't look at it like that because there's some major features that you couldn't do on the X-T3 that Fujifilm listened to their user base they've now given us. The other thing people will tend to say is, well, I just bought my X-T3 and now it's obsolete. I want to make a comment about that. The X-T3 has only been out for a little over a year. In fact, by my calculations, it's like about 14 months since it became available. So that's not that old by camera standards. Sure, if it's a phone, it might be considered a little bit aging, but we're talking about cameras here. It's still an incredible camera, and if it has the tool set that you need to create the kind of work that you want to do, it's going to be at a cheaper price point now, and I think it's still a very valid option. Now, the X-T4 is going to add a lot to it, and if those are things that you need in the video that you want to make, I think it's a great option to go with, too. I just want to make a comment, though, that the X-T3 is still a perfectly great camera. It's still available, and at the price point that you're going to be able to get it at, it's an incredible deal. But in this video, I've got some footage that I've shot that I want to share with you, and I want to go through some of the biggest differences in the new X-T4. First of all, the biggest thing is we have a new dedicated movie mode. We have much improved autofocus performance. We now have image stabilization. We obviously have a flip screen. There's a new battery and I want to talk about battery life a little bit now that I've had a couple days to shoot some video with this camera. We have things like in HD you get 240 frames a second which is a 10 times slow motion. You can record to both card slots at once so you now have a backup of any video clip that you've just filmed. There is an F-Log view assist so if you don't want to look at washed out log footage you can basically apply a LUT to the monitor and film as normal. I want to talk about crop factors because this is kind of a big deal depending on what you're shooting. There is a new feature called movie optimized control which allows you to make adjustments from either the touch screen or using the command dials. So there's a lot to cover so we're going to dive in. So the biggest difference in the way this camera operates from the X-T3 is you now have a dedicated movie mode. It's no longer separated out as a drive setting and so there's a dedicated switch on the right of the EVF where you can either be in stills mode or video mode. Now what I really like about this is that you can actually set the camera up for shutter speed, white balance, picture profile, film simulation, whatever it is that you want to have that set up to do stills with, you can move over to movie mode and you can set that up with different shutter speeds, maybe a different film simulation, maybe a different aperture setting, depending on how you have this camera set up. And so when you switch back and forth, they're two distinctive modes. So it remembers where you were. And this is a huge deal if you are a hybrid shooter and you like to go back and forth between shooting stills and video. This will give you an enormous amount of flexibility and it's really really nice to have. Sony. So let's talk a little bit about autofocus improvements on the X-T4. Now this one was kind of tough for me because all I knew is that it had improved autofocus. So this was pre-launch with a pre-production model. And so when I was shooting stills with this, you did notice that it's a little bit zippier and a little bit faster, but that's not really a metric that I can give you. But I do want to share this in video mode. Now I know that a lot of video shooters do not like to use autofocus, but some do. I go back and forth, but I have a huge need for, I'm using autofocus right now. When you have IAS, and you can trust a camera to stay in focus and lock on, that's a big deal. Now, the Fujifilm with the X-T3, I thought was pretty good with autofocus. It would drift a little bit. I mean, there were some inconsistencies with it, and all that has been cleared up on the X-T4. Now, another thing that I want to point out, and this is not just specific to the X-T4, you can do this on many Fujifilm cameras, but you do get a customizable autofocus when you are in movie mode. So, if you've ever gone through the menus and you've looked at the different autofocus modes, Fuji has different 
different scenarios set up for depending on the shooting conditions and the situation that you're shooting in. So you really do need to pay attention to that and adjust your autofocus accordingly for stills. Now, once you're over in movie mode, you do have user customizable autofocus. And so you can really tweak this out. So I want to show you an example, but I need to show it to you on here. So let me switch cameras. Hold on a second. Okay, so we are filming on the X-T4 right now. I'm just in the Provia film simulation and we are using IAF. And by default, this is usually not turned on. So make sure you go into your settings and turn it on. You're going to know it's on because when you look at the monitor, you're going to see a little square around your eye and another square green one indicating the face. And so the tracking on this is much better. Like I can just trust it to talk to the camera and it will stay in focus. It won't glip onto something behind me and try and move it. And so it also tracks if we move forward or if I move back. I'm By the way, I'm also using the 10 to 24 millimeter F4 zoom lens right now and we are wide open at F4, but it is much zippier. And I have another little test I want to show you, but I need a prop. Hold on. So we're going to use the Zeiss test chart for this little example here. But let's say for a second that you're recording some kind of demonstration, maybe a YouTube video, since that's what I do. Well, a common thing that you might want to do, and I do it when I do mail videos and everything else, when I show photographs, I hold them up to the lens and all of a sudden your focal distance changes and the object changes that the focus is trying to settle in on. And so what you end up getting is just a second where it's trying to acquire focus. But what's cool is you can go into your user custom focus settings and you can adjust not only the sensitivity, but also the speed. So when I hold something up like this, it is in focus. And then when I go back, it zips to my eye and it's really fast and you don't notice it. This is something that's super slow on other cameras. And I am a big fan of uh, being able to switch autofocus like that. It's really pretty amazing. And while we're filming on the X-T4, this is probably a good time to talk about film simulations because we have a new one, which is called Eterna Bleach Bypass. Now, right now, I'm not doing anything fancy. I'm just in standard Provia film simulation, which is kind of the default on this camera. There are some others that are really nice as well. Personally, I'm kind of a big fan of Astia Soft if you want a little bit of a film look, but you don't want it too intense. Classic Chrome can also be nice. Now, we are in pretty high contrast lighting in my studio here. I would say start to be careful with some of these because this one starts making skin tones fade out a little bit and you start to look like a vampire. And we also have Eterna, which was a big one on the X-T3. Now, Eterna is a film simulation that is based on a Fuji film stock that was used in movie film and it's a really nice profile to use in fact if you were shooting in aflog you can go to fujifilm's website and you can download a lut for eterna so what it'll do is it'll take your aflog footage and it will just convert that to eterna why would you want to do that well when you're using a lut and filming in log let's say that you want to rescue some shadow detail or maybe even in some cases bring back some highlight detail it allows you to set that up under the lut and then you feed that into the lut and it gives you much more control over what it is that you're doing i actually love eterna I love the fact that it's a little bit flat itself, and so you can add additional color grading on top if you need to. It's really quite nice. Now, I do want to talk about the new film simulations in this camera. This first one was introduced with the X-Pro3 at the end of last year. This is classic negative, which ends up being very high contrast. And I would say this, the last two film simulations that Fujifilm has added, including classic negative and this new one that we're going to look at in just a second, the Eterna Bleach Bypass, these end up moving into the territory of looks. And so I think when you're filming a talking head like you're looking at now, they get a little heavy handed. I think they look awesome on still photos, but be very careful with video. If you're shooting a film or you're shooting something that's very dramatic, this could be a really cool look. I just think it's really strange when you're listening to me talk and you're seeing this weird faux film look over the top. But anyway, this is classic negative. And finally, we have Eterna Bleach Bypass. This one is definitely heavy handed. It looks a lot different when you're in even lighting. Right here, it's kind of making me look like a ghost, but this actually is a look that people use in filmmaking applied to, like I made a comment in the last video, the movie 300. This is Sparta! 300 uses a lot of bleach bypasses, the technique, and it's basically a process in the chemicals of skipping a step, but this is the look that it yields, and it's actually really interesting. It's very high contrast, but it makes skin tones go a little bit flat, but it still leaves textures in the face. Anyway, those are the two new picture profiles that we see on the X-T4. Classic negative, we didn't have originally on the X-T3, so I wanted to include that here. And then, of course, the Bleach Bypass Eterna profile. Now, I only have one battery, and I'm trying to conserve because I've been shooting all day on this camera, and I want to get this video done, so I'm going to switch back to the other camera. So I want to talk about the big new feature in the X-T4, which is image stabilization. We have a new in-body image stabilization that moves on the sensor, and we also have a digital IS that can enhance that, and I've got some examples that I want to show, but first I want to give a quick shout-out to our sponsor today, who are the awesome folks over at Squarespace. 
squarespace.com. Present your photography using Squarespace's modern professional portfolios. The layouts are completely customizable and you can use Squarespace's drag and drop based backend system, which is really easy to use to present your work the way that you want it seen. Squarespace is an all-in-one platform for building beautiful websites, easily claiming your domain or URL, and creating a custom site that brings your ideas to life. Squarespace is host to a number of other tools, including e-commerce, appointment scheduling, and analytics so that you can grow your brand and your following. So head over to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, you can go to squarespace.com slash AOP to save an additional 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Once again, that is squarespace.com slash AOP. And I want to thank the folks at Squarespace for sponsoring another episode of The Art of Photography. One of the things that I want to share with you guys that I think is much improved on the X-T4 is I've got the gimbal out and I'm moving around, changing my exposure. I have this set up filming video right now using auto ISO. Now the way that ISO works on Fujifilm cameras, if you've ever shot video on them, is that it works in one third stop increments. And sometimes that if you're doing a long track shot, your exposure's changing, you're doing like a vlog like this, you can start to see it step up and down. This is much improved in the X-T4. It still does it, it's just much faster. So obviously you would want to lock down your ISO settings, especially if you're going to be stationary in one setting, shooting in one exposure condition. But just know that it's much improved if you need to go to auto ISO for your settings. Also note that I'm shooting autofocus with IAF and it is the best I've seen on any Fujifilm camera. So image stabilization is a new addition to the X-T lineup. We've only seen it in two previous Fujifilm cameras, the X-H1 and then in medium format with the GFX100. It works really well on both those cameras. I was really excited that they added this to the X-T4. Now I've already reviewed and talked about the stills capabilities with image stabilization. And I think that in-body image stabilization is absolutely fantastic. In fact, for me personally, it opens up a whole new world of possibilities on lenses that I just couldn't do before, especially longer lenses like the 90 millimeter F2. That's a lens that needs a lot of light. And when you don't have image stabilization, you're bottom shutter speed, even if you on, have really steady hands on a good day, is going to be maybe 1 90th of a second. When you start to go lower than that, things start to blur out. And so having image stabilization capabilities on this camera now internally is incredible. Now, it works a lot differently in video mode than it does in stills mode. So the way that image stabilization works is you actually have a motor on the sensor, and it's actually going to move on five axes to compensate for movements or shakiness in your hands. Now, that is just in-body image stabilization, or some people call it IBIS. This will also work in conjunction with optical image stabilization, which is built into some lenses. Now, not every lens has optical image stabilization. This one happens to. This is the 10 to 24 millimeter F4. It has optical image stabilization. So you can expect a little better performance with a lens that does support optical image stabilization. In fact, that is probably my favorite mode on this camera. In addition to that, Fuji has also provided a digital image stabilization and then also a boost mode on top top of that. Now, I want to say up front, I'm not a huge fan of any camera manufacturer's digital image stabilization. I just don't think we've gotten there yet. There's one exception, and that is a GoPro. Now, a GoPro has a teeny tiny sensor, and it is extremely different when you're dealing with a small sensor rather than blowing that up to APS-C in this case. It's a huge difference. And so, other than the GoPro, I just have not seen digital image stabilization work, but I did do some testing for you guys so you can see the difference for yourself. I went down to Sundance Square, because they have these awesome fountains and I wanted to do some testing at various speeds. So I did some 24p footage. I did some 60p footage that was over cranked and then slowed down in post. And I also tested out the 1080p footage that you can do at 240 frames a second. And you can see some of that here. It actually works really well. That is one of the highest frame rates on any camera that's ever been released. And it's not a gimmick mode. It actually looks pretty decent. Of course, you're seeing it upscaled to 4K here, but it retains a lot of detail and looks really good. This is a 10 times speed reduction. And what it does is it actually slows it down in camera. So it's going to just give you a file in the end that matches the frame rate that you're shooting on with the camera. You don't have to do anything in post. So all of the shots that you're looking at were done handheld. I was just holding the camera and shooting away. And I used a couple different lenses. I used the 10 to 24. I also used my 56 millimeter F 1.2, which has no optical image stabilization built in. So it's only IBIS in the camera. And to be honest with you, both of 
of them worked extremely well. They hold the shot steady. It's not going to replace a gimbal, and I don't think it was ever intended to. I think this was designed with stills in mind first, and I'm trying to hold this pretty steady, but if you want a handheld look like you see on TV shows or even in some movies, it works really well. It takes out all the micro jitters and just, I would say, don't expect to move with this, walk with it, or replace a gimbal with it. But in my own opinion, I think that it looks absolutely fabulous for handheld shooting. So, so far, all of the examples that you've seen are with either just in-body image stabilization or in-body plus optical image stabilization. So what happens when we add digital image stabilization into that mix? It's going to use all three at once. Now, I found that my results really varied. I didn't see a vast improvement, maybe just a minor improvement with certain scenes. But anytime you have anything complicated in the background or if you're using a wider angle, it starts to warble a little bit. And this is exactly the problem that I have with digital image stabilization. I don't think that this is a Fujifilm problem necessarily. I just think it's something that hasn't really been solved in any camera technology yet. And so I really found that the best way to go was just to use the straight up in-body image stabilization plus optical image stabilization. Even when you go into power boost, it does hold it very steady, but again, it all depends on the context and the scene that you're working with. Now, I also want to say that this model is a pre-production camera with pre-production firmware, and so I don't want to go too into this other than my initial impressions until I do a full review, and I think that's only fair to Fujifilm, and it's only fair to you guys, because what you may get in the released product may be a little bit different than this. It may be a little more refined. Uh, I'm just showing you what I got on this camera right now. I will do a full review later. But having said that, the straight up regular image stabilization works really well, and I'm very happy with this. This opens up a whole new world of possibilities that you can do with this camera, much like shooting stills in very low light. You can now shoot video handheld, no tripod at all. I never once locked this camera off today when I was shooting with it, and it looks fantastic. Another thing to be aware of on this camera is crop factor. Now, when you're recording at 24, 25, or 30p, there is no crop factor. You get a full data readout. Even with image stabilization or in-body image stabilization, that is still the case. Now, as soon as you start adding digital image stabilization, that's how it works. It needs a little crop area of the camera, and it's about 1.18 crop factor, so it's not much. But if you're really a stickler about this, just know that if you need to use digital image stabilization, that you do have that crop. There is an additional crop when you're shooting at 4K 60p, and that can go up to 1.29 if you're using digital image stabilization. I will say this though, Canon, it's not as bad as it could be. And I think that Fuji have done a lot with a very minimal amount of cropping. Even when you're at 1.29, it's really not the end of the world. And mainly you're going to notice it when you're using ultra wide angle lenses like this one, where you can go down to 10 millimeters. And I think that it's a pretty fair trade-off. There are some limitations with recording times when you're recording internally with the X-T4. So if you're recording at 24 frames a second, 25 frames a second, 30 frames a second, you are stuck with the standard limit of just under 30 minutes of recording time. This has to do with the European tax and it's just how it is. And so it caps off at that. And so if you're planning on recording an event or something really long with the X-T4, you're either going to need to restart the camera, use two cameras so you have it covered. Anyway, there is that limitation. If you want unlimited recording and it's not a bad option, you can go with the HDMI out as long as you have power supplied to the camera and you can record as long as you want through the HDMI port to an external recorder. So that's the work around for that. There are some limitations when you start going up in frame rate. So for instance, with 60p, you are limited to a 20 minute clip. That probably has to do with more internal heating on the camera. And I haven't had a chance to test 60p with an external recorder yet. So I don't know if that's lifted or not. I imagine it is, but don't take my word for it at this point. I don't really cover a lot of video on this channel because it's a photography channel. And so I deal more with the still side of things. But what's really interesting about cameras like the X-T4, even the X-T3 when it came along that enable us to do this hybrid style of shooting where we can do both, I think the lines are really getting blurred between what is still photography and what is video photography. And I, especially when you look at outlets like Instagram, even with Facebook video, YouTube, I think that most photographers are probably to some extent shooting video. The X-T4 is really the next generation in all of this for me. And I feel like 
as good as a camera as the X-T3 is, and if those are the features that you need, you can get it at an incredible price right now. But this is the one I would actually recommend. Um, I really am impressed with this camera, and it allows me to be able to do both stills and video by only using one setup. And I'll, you know, I'll give you another example. I've got a review coming on this, which I've only done a preview so far. This is the X-105, or the X-100V, depending on what you want to call it it shoots incredible video too and it's amazing and so this is something that if you guys would like me to cover more on i would be happy to i would really love to hear from you so drop me a comment below i'll see you guys in the next video until then later